So, your boy's back in the mix. I think I'm going to start a podcast, just so you guys know. It'll probably be coming up in the next couple of days. I actually think the first episode's going to be with some people from Cartel Jalisco. The first episode of the podcast, but we'll see. I'm going to try to involve people in organized crime and things like that to keep it relevant. Now, I do this channel with hope that people don't go to places like Zacatecas or Michoacan when I'm warning about it. But obviously, the whole world doesn't watch my channel. I'm very, very well aware of that. And in this instance, you know, that's about my hat. I'm on a ranch, you guys. Me. Um, two Americans, you know, were a, a man and a woman, a pair, actually. And there was two other people who were shot with them, another pair, a uh, man and a woman, but they were actually just wounded and they ended up surviving. Now, they were receiving a t- medical attention when they died. Uh, both of them, uh, they were both 22 years old, and they were both originally from California. Uh, but they were living in Fresno, and for the, you know, temporarily or whatever, but they are American citizens. Now, this actually happened on the 15th of February in the actual neighborhood, Manuel and Ponce, uh, what I'm about to speak on. And in this case, it was a 13-year-old kid. I'm about to speak on all the violence that goes on there against kids and pet women and, you know, people innocents. We're going to get into it deep. Now... They noticed um, the mysterious authorities, a couple of firearms, telephones, and, you know, ballistic, you, they examined the scene. And that's a miracle in itself. They usually don't even look at it. But I think when it's a 13-year-old kid and Americans and stuff, it puts pressure on them to do so, to be honest. Now, local reports said that um, the ma- they were in Bordeaux, a white pickup truck, and... That's when they were ambushed. Um, it happened at two o'clock in the afternoon. Said this is uh, this the person that's head of the public security in Zacatecas, Secretary Segura Pública Zacatecas. I'm speaking Spanish for you guys back. Now, in the morning, the municipality, you know, tried to lock down a lot and stuff and warn people. They were even trying to do like a toca de queda, which is like you stay home. Now, Zacatecas is home to the war, for those who don't know, between Cartel Jalisco and the Sinaloa Cartel. And on top of that, you have other groups like the Zetas, the Northeastern Cartel, and other people coming into this conflict at the same time, like simultaneously, making things more complicated. So it's really hard to point the finger, but it is what it is. Now, the Sedena, which is basically in charge of the Marines, um... They're fighting in nine states right now, like heavy fighting in Triangle, Nayarit, Coahuila, Chihuahua, Tamaulipas, Jalisco, Guanajuato, San Luis Potosí, Aguacalientes. Boom. Yeah, they're fighting there, you guys, and they're stretched. They're overstretched, big time. You know, they're the only formidable fighting force that Mexico really has against these groups that uh, isn't completely infiltrated. You want to look at it like that? Like, there's definitely infiltration going on, but not on the every person level like it is in most groups or most government groups i should say be specific now they just implemented the operation zacatecas too which after all these killings and it's 3,800 federal agents that are being how would you say put in the field to stop the violence so that's a lot of police but the problem is when the police are taking the money it doesn't matter how many you put out they put out 10 million and if they're on the take, they're on the take. And if people have enough money to pay them off, they pay them off. That's uh, how this game goes. And that's what's been going on to, to this group. Now, to get in a little bit more into who these people were that have been killed, let me talk about some of the people. We could look at Lisa and Brian, who four, four months of difference between them. And they live in Fresnillo. They were a pair. And they were killed. You know, this happened on the 15th of October. What happened to them and the actual killing that i talked about the americans happened on 15th of february so you guys can see the time difference between those two killings in specific now lisa and brian know each other since middle school they were together since then you know but they became uh you could call high school sweethearts later on in life now he was killed at a bar with a musical acquaintance of his you could say Cesar Marina, and this happened at 11 o'clock, you know, armed subjects showed up at the place where they're at and started sh- shooting everybody that was there. Um, they were 11 months together. 
they were completing 11 months together when uh, this happened. So, you know, you can look at on her social media on the 8th of November, she publicated a video that it would be coming up on their first first year together. Uh, that we let, her, her exact words were, we left everything aside for love, like there was no tomorrow. He won my heart and my trust. Sad, you know. Um, at least they found each other before they passed away. A lot of people leave this world without finding someone like that. So, very sad. Um, I'll put their finger up in the thumbnail. I'm actually doing it right now. Sad. Very sad. But that is uh, the case in Mexico right now. This story repeats itself everywhere. You can look at where Lisa died and... At the at the on, in the colonia Manuel and Ponce and Fresnillo, we, we talk about the thirteen year old kid who got killed too. We already spoke on that specific, so I'm not even gonna go over that again. But if you look at the University of Zacatecas where Lisa studied, um, they've expressed their condolences. But at the same time, you can look at another ha happening that happened just last week, where six people were, and some of them were students, the majority were kidnapped coming out of a bar in the capital of Zacatecas. And, you know, things like this are kind of being swept under the rug. We can look at Valeria Landeras Calderon, who's dis disappeared, 24 years old. Alexa Monsaraz Abrego Esqueda, 25 years old, women also. Irving Catarres, 21 years old. Natalia Torres Valderas, 21. Luis Anjo Manzana Cortes, 25. Now, the Monsaraz was a student. Irving was a student as well. Natalio and Luis, they were all picked up the the last Friday when they were coming out of a nightclub. Now, a Ford Lobo with the plate numbers ZCB21621, which was actually theirs, you know, that belonged to them, were used to take them, you know, hostage. Um, they pulled up on the State Highway 181 in the municipality of Garlano, Cordina. Uh, that's where they left the bodies of the university students. But they never found the body of Valeria Landeros Calderon, which is terrifying to me because in, in, in these situations, it's horrible to say, but I'd rather be dead than captured because some of these groups, I gotta be very careful what I say are willing to exploit young women in horrible ways. And if I was her, I would have rather been dead with the people, honestly, uh, with my friends than alive and held captive by these demons, if you want to call them that, because that's probably who they are. They're taking innocent people coming out of a bar. Probably some evil pieces of shit, to be honest. You know? Um, crazy. I've been crazy... I've been very careful not to test and things like that, but as in demonetized, I guess it really doesn't matter as much anymore. But crazy, crazy, crazy that people are willing all to do this, you know, for a little bit of money. And sometimes even for free. They just do it because it's entertaining or they're ordered to pick up so many people so many nights and they just pick people up to make it look like they're actually doing something instead of picking up the enemy because they know they'll get shot. They'll go pick up some innocent people and say they're the enemy. Stuff like that. That happens. Um, Sicarios play games lots of times with these groups, and when the cat's away, the mice will play, you know, sometimes when the big boss isn't there, they go do their own thing, and yeah, they'll report five bodies, and he'll see five bodies, the boss will see five bodies thrown out the next day, and he'll see the names, it won't really mean anything to him, especially the Sicarios, oh yeah, they admitted to selling, they could lie, you know, the Sicarios, they admitted to selling coke, weed, da 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 that's what they tell their boss, and that's why they kill them, they're working for the opposition, so on and so forth, but we all know that's not true. But point is, they'd rather do that than go find a firefighter with the enemy and possibly get killed. Depends on the group, but I'm saying, you know, this kind of thing does happen. So you guys can put it in uh, to perspective. I know you're probably thinking wherever you live in the world, these things don't happen. So it's not normal, and I understand that. But unfortunately, you know, in Zacatecas and Michoacan, women are a commodity now. You want to look at it like that, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise anyone going down there even for vacation as a family, anything at all. That's just me, me personally, you know. And that says something because I'm pretty willing to travel throughout the country wherever I go. I know people and groups and things that make make it safe for me wherever I want to go. But 
you sometimes you don't want to risk it because there's so much instability. Even if one group promises you safe passage, that doesn't mean the other group will come in and then kill you because you're cool with these guys. It's a complicated game, being a journalist here, and uh, it is what it is. You know, it's worth it as far as pe warning people and letting people know the truth. I know I've saved lots of lives and I've saved lots of people from getting into that life, but still, crazy world, you can't save everyone. Adios, amigos.